Amen. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Luke 15? Luke chapter 15. We'll be looking at verses 11 through 32. <clears throat> This is one of the most familiar stories that Jesus ever told. And when I use that word familiar, sometimes it's, it's a little bit uh, scary because when I use that word familiar, it means we just get very comfortable and we kind of can just brush over it and think there's, there's nothing in there for us because we've read it so many times. Um, it's one of the greatest parables. It's right up there with the Good Samaritan. Probably everyone in this room knows the story of the prodigal. But it's my hope this morning that we would gain some new insights into this passage that would practically affect our lives and deepen our relationship, most importantly, with our Heavenly Father. We'll be looking at all three characters in this parable, and as we walk through this, I want us to consider two questions. What would Jesus' original hearers, the scribes and the Pharisees, probably have been thinking about the prodigal son, the loving father, and the elder brother as he told this story? What would Jesus' original hearers, the scribes and the Pharisees, probably have been thinking about the prodigal son, the loving father, and the elder brothers, he told this story. And what extraordinary attribute of God lies at the center of this parable? In verse 1 and 2, Jesus is having a meal with those who are considered unholy tax collectors, notorious sinners. These religious leaders of Israel, the scribes and the Pharisees, are grumbling about who Jesus is fellowshipping with. You know, these guys, they consider it beneath them to associate with people like this. This grumbling in verse 2, though, sets the stage for why Jesus is telling the three parables in Luke 15, which concern things that are lost and found. In verses 3 through 7, we read about the lost sheep that was found, and in verses 8 through 10, we read about the lost coin that was found. And my focus this morning will be on the lost son who was found. You know, when the Pharisees and scribes heard the sins of the prodigal, I mean, I wonder if they would have warmed up to him as a character or personally to identify with him. I also wonder when they saw the kindness and generosity shown by the loving Father in the face of scorn, would they have appreciated Him for what kind of graciousness? Or would they have criticized this Father for having a lack of judgment and for being a failure in parental discipline? And would the attitude toward the sinners of their time, just like the attitude of the elder brother to the prodigal, have been the same mindset of those of the Pharisees against the tax collectors and sinners whom Jesus was associating with over a meal. So as we hear these familiar words read, let's keep on the lookout for what we can learn from each of these three characters. Two brothers and an earthly father are going to teach us some significant things about our Heavenly Father. So look with me in chapter 15, verse 11. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So when he so when he went and hired so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed 
pigs. And he was longing to feed the pigs. Feed the, he was longing to feed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you and never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. You know, the path of this story is very interesting. We didn't read the other two familiar parables, but I wanted to mention something here. Jesus, when Jesus tells of the shepherd looking for lost sheep, we find that easy to identify with that good shepherd. And when he describes the woman who had lost the coin and all that she had to go through to find it, we can find it easy to identify with her, situ her situation. But when Jesus begins to describe the prodigal, the very last thing that people in his own time would have done would have been to start rooting for this guy and pulling for him. Honestly, the more Jesus tells us about this young prodigal, the more reason we have to look down on him. It is not quite as easy to identify with the prodigal and how his situation played out in this story. I think Jesus is doing this for a reason. Jesus has an unlikely main character placed right in the middle of an important lesson. It's a lesson about God. It's a lesson about the gospel. And it's a lesson about our own hearts that are sometimes so hardened to our need and so slow to repent of sin. Let's begin with the younger son, the prodigal. Jesus tells us that this young man goes to his father and asks his father to divide the property with the older brother and give him what is coming to him. Now you need to understand that when Jesus says this, the people who are originally hearing him would have been very surprised. Why? Because they lived in a culture where fathers were deeply respected and regarded. And for that younger son to go and say to his father, go ahead and give me all of my inheritance that is coming to me, is like saying, Father, 
It's like saying, Father, I wish you were dead. I wish I could just get my material resources that are coming to me and go. I love your wealth more than I love you. In fact, I would like to just get all of my inheritance and leave. So the people who are listening to Jesus are not going to like this young man. Also, that young man is asking the father to do something that is against all custom and even perhaps legal practices in his day. A father could not give his property to his sons prior to his death. He always remained the owner of his property until he died. And then that responsibility was passed on to his sons. So this son is not only showing deep disrespect for the father, but he's also asking the father to do something that is not customary and maybe even illegal. So he dishonors his father. He disgraces his father. He disowns his father. And then the next thing that we see the son do after a matter of a few days, after doing this offensive act towards his father, which would have rightly in Jesus' day brought about punishment like a beating or even worse, he could have been disowned by his father had he done such a thing in Jesus' culture. He literally turns his back on his father and walks away. He doesn't turn around. He doesn't respond. He doesn't make eye contact. In his heart, his father is dead. And there stands this devastated dad. And the next thing we see is that he gathers up his possessions and he goes far away from his father into another country and he spends his money recklessly. And this is where we get the name, the prodigal from. He's prodigal. He's wasteful. He's lavish. He's riotous. He is unrestrained. He is irresponsible in his living. You know, even the elder brother, the, the, one who is, um, the one who is religious, the elder brother even reveals at the end of the story that the prodigal specifically goes out and spends money on prostitutes. So once again, the scribes and the Pharisees who are hearing this story are not going to have a high regard for this young man. We learn that the prodigal reaps what he sows and the consequences of his choices begin to play out. A famine comes. And when the famine comes, he has spent all of his money and he has to hire himself out as a servant to a stranger. And the stranger puts him to work feeding pigs. The Jewish people of Jesus' day would have had the same attitude towards pigs as modern day Muslims. This wasn't a good job for a Jewish boy to do. Not at all. And this boy not only is feeding pigs, he's not only being cared for by his master, he's serving and he's eating the same food that the pigs are eating. And at this point, I can just hear the religious person or the self-righteous person just waiting for Jesus to say, this is why you should never disrespect your father. This is why you should never squander your wealth. This is why you shouldn't associate with the unclean. This is why you shouldn't spend your money on prostitutes. This is what happens when you do. But then comes verse 17, because see, the story doesn't end with the situation of the prodigal in complete disarray and a master who is abusing him. We read, and we can look together in verse 17, it says, He came to himself. And some translations say he came to his senses. This story, guys, right here, has a surprising turn. 
This is the beginning of the prodigal repenting. See, he realizes what he's come to. He realizes where he's fallen from, and he realizes what he's become, and he begins to reason and wrestle within himself, and he begins to realize who he has offended. You see, as he thinks to himself in verse 18, he says that he's going to go to his father and say, Father, I understand that by what I've done, that I have sinned against you, I've sinned against God. God is displeased with the way that I've lived. I have dishonored you, Father, a loving and generous Father. I have disgraced you as a son, and I no longer deserve to be called your son. So I want to just ask you if you would just take me back as one of your servants. That's what he's asking. Just take me back as one of your servants. This guy is just thinking about becoming a servant. He isn't even thinking about returning as a son. And he begins to rehearse his plan in his mind. Now, why is Jesus telling us this story? He's telling us this story, I believe, because he wants to emphasize how ready our gracious Father is to receive repentant sinners. The son realized what he had done. He felt the painful consequences of his sin, and he threw himself at his Father's mercy. You know, Jesus knows that we would most likely think that a sinner like this is beyond hope. We would of forgiveness and beyond hope of turning from a life of indulgence and destruction, which the Son had been pursuing with great delight. And yet, I want to say to you, this parable brings us much hope. This parable brings us much hope. The son comes to his senses. He comes to himself and he goes back to his father and his father receives him with much joy. Now there are many lessons in this for us, brothers and sisters, and one message is this. If you are a child of God and you choose to go the way of the prodigal, following your own sin, the Father will track you down. Take encouragement right there, you that are praying for your prodigal daughters or son. The Father will track you down. I often ask young people, why would you choose to walk away from a father who loves you and has your best interest in mind? Well, I think I know the answer to that now, but, and I've personally experienced the consequences of choosing my own way. I was once very acquainted with the foolish man. Still am sometimes, just ask my wife. <laughs> the prodigal walked away from his earthly father and his heavenly father. We see that the Lord has brought him to a dark place before he came to his senses. Yes, he's brought him to a dark place. If you are a child of God, your heavenly Father will pursue you, and if necessary, he will bring you to a dark place. Why? In order to bring you back to himself. It's best that the Father does not have to pursue you into a faraway country and bring you to the pigsty and a dark place and to the end of yourself before you see how much you need Him and before you turn again to Him in repentance. But the encouraging thing we see about this passage is this man came to his senses. He realized what he was and what he had done and who, most importantly, who he had sinned against his heavenly father and his earthly father and he repented 
And Jesus is encouraging us that the Father will receive those who repent and turn to Him. He is waiting with outstretched arms for each and every prodigal. He is waiting with outstretched arms. Is He not? Yes. I mean, receive the hope of our Heavenly Father's message this morning. This leads us to the second person in the story that I want to give attention to, the Father. And we meet Him in a couple of places. First of all, when the Son goes to Him in verse 12, you can see there, He asks Him to split the property. And all we're told is the Father simply says, the Father divided the property between them. There was no argument. There was no fussing and fighting. The Father simply just divides the property between them. Remember, this would not have made Jesus' hearers approve of this Father. Because the Son is insulting His Father by asking that the property be divided up. Jesus' hearers would have thought, if this were a just man, He would have beat His Son and He would have disowned Him. But the Father just divides the property. And at the end of the story, when the Son has come back, the Father, we're told, looks out at a distance and He sees Him. And what do we read in verse 20? He feels compassion and He runs and He embraces Him and He kisses Him. I read in my study that in the culture of Jesus' day that it was not considered dignified for an older man to run. It would have required him lifting up his long robe and sprinting and that was, and that was not thought to be a dignified thing for an older man to do. But here is this father, listen, who has been painfully offended by his evil son sprinting towards Him in compassion and love to receive Him. And the next thing we see Him do is this. He says in verse 22, Look, bring quickly the best robe. Now whose robe in the house would have been the best robe? The Father's robe would have been the best robe in the house. And I also read that there's no indication that the sun had even bathed yet. Can you imagine putting a best coat on a boy he had been eating and feeding with the pigs? But go, get the best robe. And he puts it on his son and he says, give him a ring. I mean, really? Give him a ring? I mean, I mean, I mean, the guy just got, he just got a robe. I mean, give him a ring. And this is a sign of his sonship. He's given a signet ring, which means he's a son again in the family. It just keeps getting better. And then give him sandals. Somewhere along the way, he must have worn out his shoes. Because in that day, slaves went barefoot. Those who were free wore shoes. You see, the Father doesn't say, let's just wait. Let's just wait a few months. If I feel like He's made some changes, if you've earned it, then I'll give Him some grace. And we're, so we're told here, have the best robe, have a signet ring, have shoes. He's welcomed back into the household, not as a servant, but as a son. And the scribes and the Pharisees listening to Jesus would probably have been thinking, how prodigal is that? I mean, what a waste. That is this way too generous. Nobody would have been thinking that the Father was going to do the right thing. They would have been saying, man, you are going way too far in your kindness that you are showing this renegade son of yours. And that's exactly what Jesus wants us to understand. We all probably know someone who has fallen under deep conviction of sin. Listen up. And they're so deep in their conviction and shame that they cannot believe that God would receive them in light of what they've done. 
I know some people like that. They cannot believe because of their sin that God would receive them back in light of what they've done. And maybe this is you. And you know why? Because we don't believe at times that God is full of grace and mercy. See, Jesus is showing us that we have a gracious Father who will never turn a sinner who has repented of his sins. He will surely welcome such a one home. Friends, this parable is about God the Father and His extraordinary grace. And the gospel even makes this better. And this is hard just to talk quietly about, but the gospel makes this even better because the Father doesn't just wait with open arms for us to come home to Him. He sent His Son into a far country to die for us, to receive the punishment that we deserve. And He sends this Holy Spirit to draw us to faith in His Son and bring us back into fellowship with the Father Himself. That's what our God has done for us. Us. And he wants to do for those who are far off. Lastly, let's look at the reaction of the elder brother. Notice that it picks up in verse 25 and following. The elder brother is not happy at all. When he comes back to the house and hears that there's a party going on, he asks one of the servants what's going on and he finds that the younger brother has come back home and he is furious. And consequently, he is showing deep disrespect for his father too, this religious son. Notice how he does it. First of all, in verse 28, we're told that he was angry and that he refused to go in. Now let me, now a fatted calf would have been enough food to feed the whole village. So the whole village is there. The whole village is there. And this elder son is outside. The party's going on inside. The father wants the elder son to come in. Everybody in town is there. The father wants his elder brother to come in. And the son refuses to come in. Now what does that mean? It means that everybody in town knows that there is a domestic dispute going on between the dad and the firstborn. And the firstborn is showing him great dishonor and he's shaming him in front of the whole community. Then the father goes outside to talk to his son. Does he get a nice fatherly response? No. Take a look and see what the son says in verse 29. He answers his father, Look, all these years I have served you and never disobeyed your command. And you've never given me so much as a goat to have a party with my friends. And yet the son of yours, notice that, yet the son of yours, not my, not my brother, but this son of yours who wasted your property on riotous living and prostitutes has come back home and you've killed the fatted calf for him. What's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. We are hearing the voice of someone who thinks he hasn't gotten what he deserves. We're hearing the voice of someone who thinks he is entitled to God's favor. And we're hearing the voice of someone who has no idea how to rejoice when someone who doesn't deserve the love of God and the grace of God and the forgiveness of God receives it. This elder brother thinks he deserves what's coming to him from his father. And he doesn't think that he stands in need of grace. So therefore, because of that, he can't rejoice. In my study of this parable, I read, I found that just from a legal standpoint, the elder brother has absolutely nothing to lose by the younger brother coming home. He's still going to get two-thirds of the estate. The younger brother's coming home has no legal consequences for the elder brother. But you know what? It does sadly reveal that his heart has not understood how much he stands in need of God's grace. So, 
we see here that Jesus is confronting those who are criticizing him for fellowshipping with sinners. And he's saying to the Pharisees, you need to understand this, that my receiving of these sinners is a picture of our gracious Father's attitude towards those who have strayed and have now come to their senses and have repented and trusted in God again. And the attitude of the Pharisee is an attitude which reflects their own hearts, that they are strangers to grace that they themselves do not understand that they stand in need of grace. But brothers and sisters, this message is not just a message for the Pharisees. You know, we're all recovering Pharisees, whether you know it or not. I learned that a long time ago from Kent Hughes when I was reading. We're all recovering Pharisees. Jesus' message isn't just for the Pharisees, it's for us. None of us stand deserving of God's grace. I know I don't. But when we are begrudging in our attitudes towards those who receive it, it shows that perhaps we think we deserve that grace and we don't understand the nature of our need. You know, there's two prodigals in this story. There is the religious one and there's the rebellious one. It's just that one of them, as far as we know, didn't know that he was prodigal. He was in a household with a loving father. He was obeying him and all that he commanded, but he thought that he deserved the father's favor and he didn't see his own sin of pride. See, the Father meets us. He meets our guilt with grace. He meets our mess with mercy. And He meets our sin with salvation through His precious Son, Jesus Christ. Listen to this quote by Puritan John Owen. Don't let the word Puritan scare you. I just didn't know how to categorize him. The greatest sorrow and burden that you can lay on the Father, the greatest unkindness you can do to Him is not to believe that He loves you. Did you hear me? The greatest sorrow and burden that you can lay on the Father, the greatest unkindness that you can do to Him is not to believe that He loves you. You, 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 me. Think about it. Because if you believe that He loves you, there is no way that you could not receive the grace He lavishes on us and rejoice in the grace that He shows to others. You know, it's very interesting that Jesus doesn't tell us how this parable ends. Maybe, maybe it's because he's, he's leaving the door open for the Pharisees to repent. And you know what? Maybe he's leaving the door open for you and me to repent. Yeah. Think about it. these. These are good home group questions. Think about this. I've been, I've been rehearsing these for three weeks. Do we need to repent of a Pharisaical attitude of heart? Do we need to turn from wanting to go our own way? Do we need to repent of pride and self-sufficiency and acknowledge our need of Him? What about unbelief? Do we need to repent of not believing that God loves us and is a good God? And listen to this. Do we understand His grace so deeply that we can rejoice when God pours His grace on another, one that we think might not deserve it. You know what? Whatever your takeaway is from this parable, in whichever character you might identify with, and by the way, I identify with the prodigal, with both. My prayer is that we would would see that we have a gracious Father who has come to seek and save the lost.
So let me ask you, what do you hear when, you hear, when, you, when the Father says in this last verse, this son of mine was dead. He has come to life again. He was lost and he is found. If you, may this be your prayer for your prodigal that you're praying for. That this son or daughter of mine was dead. And he or she has come to life again. He or she was lost. And he or she has been found. Let's pray. Lord, regardless of which character that we identify with, I pray, Lord, that we would all recognize the love and grace of our Heavenly Father. Lord, whether we're walking in pride or in shame or, Lord, rebellion, that we all, we all need your forgiveness and grace. Father, I pray that you would bring prodigals to their senses and draw them to their graciousness of the Heavenly Father. Bring each of us to our senses that we might recognize our sin. Turn and run to you, Lord. It's your kindness that brings us to repentance. And this gives us much hope. Just ask your blessing upon the word of God and your people in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>